About 20 years ago, my brother and I were hiking in the woods in the Holly State Forest, and we saw a ser what appeared to be a serpent's wall. It undulated up a 20-foot glacial erratic. The last seven stones were about a ton apiece, and they were all chalked up on either side. And the last stone had an eye and an iris carved in it and looked like a serpent's head. And they were joined on vertical planes. And I looked at it, and it just didn't make any sense to me. It didn't, it didn't fit the colonial context. It was totally illogical. And then I, <laughs> it, it haunted my mind for several years. I, I just shelved it and didn't understand. And then I came back um, and I read Manitou by Maver and Dix in 1987 that um, two researchers who wrote all about the stoneworks in New England. And it just clicked in my head. And I then went on a quest uh, to find out, to get to the bottom of what all these structures are about and why we haven't heard about them. So I will move into that arena. I will do my best to present a case that through various forms of carbon dating, astronomical alignments, common sense, historical records, Native American oral history, uh, to prove that these are indeed what I proclaim they are and what many other researchers proclaim to be. I have recently published a series of articles in Ancient American Magazine, and luckily I got the cover of the Goshen Equinox Chamber. I am writing my third article uh, in the series, and a lot of the information tonight will be in that article also. So, stone builders, mound builders, and the mysteries of ancient America. What we're told about the history of the United States, the history of ancient America, is basically that you had disorganized tribes that were uh, involved in hunting and gathering, maybe some uh, rude uh, creation of ceremonial tools or weapons. Um, we really have not got the, the story, even in college courses to this day, about uh, races that existed uh, beyond belief, uh, levels of sophistication, adva advanced mathematics, engineering. I will show all this. And none of the majority of what I show outside of the stonework is not challenged by any academic. It's, uh, it is known, but for whatever reason, the paradigm does not like it. The mound builders, about 5,500 years ago, the mound builders appeared in the United States. Uh, I will show that they were a separate race from Native Americans, although I can't claim to know what happened. It looks like interbreeding took place. Uh, I'll talk about Native American oral, oral history, but this was a highly sophisticated race, um, and they appeared 5,500 years ago at Watson Break, Louisiana. And as you see, they had a wide area of influence. They're, as a matter of fact, up in Wisconsin, some of, some of uh, their creations uh, existed up there. There were nearly 200,000 earthen pyramids, geometric figures, and conical mounds when the colonists showed up of astounding and staggering size. This is Poverty Point, Louisiana. I think it's uh, dated to 3,000 years old. The embankments that were formed here, th these are cities too, these are tens of thousands of people lived here uh, from thousands of years ago up until 1500 AD. Uh, right here is like a woodhenge, uh, astronomical calendar. The embankments in this structure would fill the Great Pyramid 30 times with earth. The centerpiece of the site, a 72-foot high, 600-foot long bird effigy. That's twice as tall as the green monster. So, to give you some perspective, that presently, that's a satellite shot of, of what is left of the earthworks there. This is Cahokia in Illinois. That is a car. The base is 14 acres, one acre larger than the Great Pyramid of Giza, 100 foot high. This, uh, it took them 22 million cubic tons, I mean yards of earth to create this, and they brought it from a mile away. An astounding creation, and here is a recreation of it. There is the monk's mound, the pyramid I just showed you. Here is other truncated pyramids, pyramids, conical mounds, uh, astronomical uh, woodhenge, a massive city, one of the largest cities at the time. It thrived up until 1500 AD, and mysteriously, when the uh, first explorers, the Spanish, showed up, it was, it was uninhabited. Grave Creek, um, West Virginia, a massive, 
This isn't uh, throwing some earth down. They had to build it and, you know, they had to level the site and build it in a very sophisticated way so it just didn't uh, fall apart when it rained. And, you know, these structures are thousands of years old. Aztec looking, some recreations. Some theorize that the mound builders actually built, built these structures, but much earlier than archaeologists will admit. And these were the earthworks. Squire and Davis in 1846 uh, worked for the Smithsonian, and they mapped all these structures, and they uh, did extensive mapping. And what they found was these weren't close. Uh, <laughs> geometrically, they were perfect. They learned how to square the circle. They understood square roots, pi, uh, amazing, uh, <laughs> Pythagorean theorem. Uh, and these were astounding structures that were amazingly precise. And we have never heard of this. It's astounding that um, we didn't learn this, this, at least in college. The, the former head of the Smithsonian did not know that the mound builders existed until 1992. Yes, that's like not on the pyramids, I hear. It's ridiculous. This is the Newark earthwork, one of the most enigmatic earthworks on Earth. 20 acres, 30 acres. Truncated pyramids. It is a sophisticated lunar observatory, among other things. Ask a farmer how big that is. <laughs> it is preserved as a golf course. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, so, thankfully. Uh, it measures the 18.61 metonic cycle of the moon, among other things. Uh, the Athenian met meton in 432 a uh, BC is supposed to be the originator of uh, the metonic cycle, but uh, I think we see now that it was understood well before his time. Right through, this is what it looks like. It is a, an eclipse predictor, which is very sophisticated. Some of the geometry used here is Mayan-like. Um, what you have here is the uh, series of earthworks at Newark. Right here is the circle in the octagon. See this road right here? It connected another site to Chillicothe, Ohio, 55 miles away. There were earthen walls 12 foot high, exactly 192 foot wide, the entire length, straight as an arrow, if you can believe that. This is the Great Serpent Mound right here. Uncoiling. And it has an egg in its mouth. This, uh, they believe the Adena built this, but it might even be older than 5,000 years old. Um, it is the largest earthen effigy mound on the planet and is built on one of the largest geomagnetic anomalies on Earth. They think a meteor hit here. And, you know, the shaman, the diviner, uh, whoever uh, understood such things knew it was a very good site to build such a thing. And it also... Um, is a precise calendar. It predicts eclipses. These are all the major or minor standstills of the moon. Um, so it understand it is a, uh, it, it shows a knowledge of the metonic 18.61 year cycle of the moon, but it also has uh, advanced geometry, mathematics, and astronomy embedded in it. That is beyond belief. I went to a, a conference recently and a researcher his entire presentation was on what was embedded in this earthwork, which he, he was a, a former uh, jet propulsion laboratory scientist from NASA, and it blew me away, but I can't do that right now. Uh, another uh, thing that the mountain builders did, they extracted between 500 million and 1.5 billion pounds of the purest grade copper on Earth from the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. Now, science, scientists and engineers estimated that it would take 10,000 men a thousand years to extract that much. So this is a civilization we're talking about. This isn't, you know, uh, hunter-gatherer stuff. This is mind-boggling sophistication. And when the, the Smithsonian led the charge to open the, the earthen mounds and the burial mounds of the mound builders from like 1850 to 1910, and this is some of what was recovered. Uh, advanced metallurgy, iron implements, car, uh, hardened copper. This looks like, uh, actually, a couple of these look uh, Mesoamerican to me. A shell gorget from Georgia. Sophisticated, really uh, beautiful artwork. The Princess of Astalan, Astalan, Wisconsin. In a burial mound, they found uh, the burial of a queen or a princess, and 
2,000 polished shells were embedded and interwoven um, in her garments. And everybody has different disciplines here. Some people could say, oh my God, the metallurgy. Some people could say fabric making, that's very sophisticated also, or the polishing of uh, shells. Yes, the beaver pipe. Steatite, carved panther, puma. Very sophisticated, very, very showing. Well, when you do these things, it requires a, an organized culture. The Grave Creek tablet, Grave Creek, West Virginia, I already showed you the slide. One of the things that came out was strange uh, uh, hieroglyphs and, and figures and languages that were never deciphered came out, showing that the mound builders were, in fact, a different race altogether. More of the same, Michigan tablets, odd hieroglyph-like figures. Uh, so in the Southwest, what was happening? We're told not much. That is not true. The Orion Zone, Gary David, uh, he documents the star cities, the Anasazi and the Hopi um, cities in the Southwest being exact replicas of all the major stars in the Orion system. They had advanced astronomy. They built structures like this, kivas, observatories. Being a stonemason, this makes my skin crawl. <laughs> How can you do this? Built into a side of a cliff, utterly ridiculous. And they were engineers. They, they, they built canals and, and uh, did amazing feats with irrigation. What about New England? Well, we're told any stone ruin you see um, over the last, was built over the last four or 500 years since colonists showed up here. Um, I will put that theory to the test. America's Stonehenge. This is a site in Mystery Hill, New Hampshire. It's a 30-acre complex of 19 cha stone chambers, drains, fireplaces, um, carved stones, standing stones, astronomical alignments. It is <laughs> called a colonial ruin by archaeologists. And I, I will show uh, the sophistication of the building and the astronomical alignments here. They, did 13, they dug 13 test pits and they found carbon dates from 100 AD to 2000 BC at the site. That's a 4.5 ton carved stone of granite. Right there, sorry the picture's a little shaky. Chambers, intricately built. Every piece of stonework that I'll show you was all dry laid. There was no mortar used in any of these constructions. This is called the Oracle Chamber. There are 15 and 20 ton stones embedded in the structure. And the idea that a colonist would do that is, uh, doesn't really seem to make sense. There's a 40, the two largest stones at the site are 45 and 70 tons. The largest stone in the Great Pyramid of Giza is 70 tons also. 200 alignments to the sun, the moon, and 45 stars. And there's a satellite shot of the place. It, it, um, they, did, uh, they bore down to bedrock on 50 points at the site, and they found that four, 5,000 years ago when the place was built, it was mostly barren and that it was uh, just a great astronomical observatory. Obviously, over the last couple thousand years, uh, things have grown back or grown in, but look at the radial lines. It is an observatory, and that's a satellite shot. So you see stones all over the site that mark the equinoxes and the solstices, the Goshen Stone Mysteries. In the early 1800s, two boys were chasing uh, a rabbit in this site near the cemetery off of Route 9 near Goshen Stone. And the rabbit went in and the boys unearthed where he had went into a burrow. And what they found was a stone tunnel that went 16 feet down, 68 feet in one direction, and 16 feet in the other direction. All dry laid, a, uh, a ridiculous work. Um, one ton stones all around the top of it. And it's very hard, it's, once you get through the uh, layer over in Goshen there, it's all hard pan. It, the very idea of digging into that, there's wild theories about Underground Railroad and things like that, or counterfeit is den, that just don't make sense. And there's other of these structures around New England too. So it, it, in, a, in a larger context, it's something different. So Whittle um, excavated the site. He found artifacts there. He found hammer stones. Uh, this is at the Goshen Histor Historical Museum found a strange stone disk. 
Uh, it shows evidence of, or it, it um, was done with uh, pressure flaking, the way arrowheads are made. Whoever made this disc went through a lot of work. Five such discs have been found around New England, all at late archaic quarry sites. Um, uh, Dr. Um, William Fitzhugh at the Rowe site, at the uh, Fife Brook site up in Rowe, did a dig for Northeast Utilities in 1972. He found one of these. At Calendar One, Maver and Dix, another site I'll show you, they also found another one of these. It is a ceremonial uh, sun disc, and I believe the structure at Goshen was probably used as a, a shamanic ritual site, maybe, something like that, a ceremonial site. That's my intuition. And obviously, you spend two weeks in the hall, you're, uh, <laughs> you're happy to see the sun again. Uh, this is about a mile from that tunnel in Goshen. Here's the Goshen Equinox Chamber. This is one of hundreds of these structures in New England. So, it's uh, very well made. It's at about 1,400 feet facing east. Oh, sorry, Kyle. Uh, look at the, the work here. This is, when we get stone delivered, it's from the quarry. And working with um, this type of stone is very difficult. There's no quarrying marks in any of these structures. Um, so, somebody took an enormous amount of effort, made a double stack column, and there were nine interlocking lintel stones, massive quartzite lint, uh, lintel stones, that interlock and allow the structure to stand the test of time. The um, structure here is, show, is shown by the two columns. Look at these stones, nine interlocking stones. And after they built it, it's a 30 by 30 stone footprint, and then they covered it in earth, which is uh, a, a quite a piece of work. My friends and I went up there, uh, not this winter, last winter, to see if it was oriented to the winter solstice. Uh, half of the chambers of New England that still exist are oriented to the equinox sunrise or the winter solstice sunrise, like the chambers in Europe and elsewhere. So we went up, the uh, sun was months away, and we said, let's go back next March 20th and see what happens. So this was my um, Raiders of the Lost Ark moment. I'm in the chamber and my friends are outside. And as it comes up at 6 in the morning, right down the pipe. And it was funny. There's this like, strange face here. See the mouth and the eye? Almost looks like enlightenment. And I, uh, Whittle, they were open-minded, these archaeologists. They had a douser up there who, um, he found a spring underneath, and he found there was an electromagnetic line of force that ran right through the middle of this chamber. Whoever built this understood geomancy, uh, magnetic lines of force, ley lines. They understood um, the invisible realms. And Dr. Bruce Cornett from um, Lamont Dory Laboratories took a proton precession magnometer to many of these that it measures uh, the magnetic field in the Earth. And he found the same anomaly that there was geomagnetic lines of force that ran outside the entranceway of these chambers. There were standing stones, uh, carns, and other structures around the site. There was also this right near the chamber. It's an effigy mound. There's a quartzite head, and this is 40 feet long, built on a big platform. I uncovered it so you could see it. That gives you some scale. An effigy is a, a stone or earth representation of the spirit of an animal. So let's get to the stone chambers in New England. We're told that these are root cells, which there's a lot of reasons it doesn't make sense. Um, the distribution. 40% of the chambers in New England are in Putnam County, New York. The, the last settled place in New York State, the rockiest, most inhospitable area to grow anything. Um, they're poorly ventilated. They don't, they, they, um, the food rots in them. People have, researchers have uh, done tests with these places. There is no um, doorway hinges. There's no accommodation made to put a door on these things. They're all, you know, is a raccoon going to walk in and eat it all? There's no accommodations for shelving. Uh, and there are many colonial reports uh, of finding these things when they showed up. There's a lot of evidence in carbon dating uh, that shows that um, these chambers are not root cellars. The hurricane of 1938, two girls were looking in the woods in Montville, Vermont, and they, uh, Montville, Connecticut, and a huge maple had toppled over. And what they found was this structure. This entrance is 22 inches by 16 inches. You have to crawl on your stomach about the first half of the 37.5 feet of, of this structure. 
Right, right there is where the maple, the, that was exposed, there's the entrance. So you crawl and then you get up and you get to the very end, 38 feet later, and you could sit cross-legged in this structure and that's it. It's carved into the side of a hill. Uh, it doesn't make sense as a root cellar, obviously. It's, it's just a, and uh, it's in an area that, in, in Montville, Connecticut, where ancient stone monuments are listed on the oldest handwritten deeds in town. Upton Chamber, Upton, Massachusetts. The entranceway, um, you travel 14 and a half feet, four and a half feet high, to get into a 12 foot high, 11 foot diameter circular chamber with three ton interlocking stones in the roof. This is a, a picture of it. All this is gravel fill. The entire structure is um, ca carved into the side of a hill. If you are making a root cellar, do you go through all this effort? And let me tell you, if somebody hired me to do this and I had 15 guys in six months, I don't know what I'd do, quite honestly. It is just an enormous amount of work and sophistication, corbeling. Uh, this is not easy <laughs> to, to uh, put it lightly. This is calendar one. Maver and Dix, um, they went to the site and spent nearly seven years at it uh, in uh, Vermont, called Calendar One in Woodstock. Right here, this wall here, this is where he found the stone disc way down. That, fall, that wall eventually went 13 feet down to the bedrock. So what is the purpose of a 13-foot wall that has been covered with hundreds and thousands of years of earth? This is from 1000 BC in Ireland, a national treasure. This is uh, spray painted inside uh, Woodstock, Vermont, considered a root cellar, not even paid attention to. Uh, but I will tell you some interesting things about this chamber. That doorway, um, well first, this is Harvard's Dr. Barry Fell checking out the area. Look at how big it is. Nine 14 foot long, over three ton stones comprise the roof. The doorway uh, marks the declination angles 18.3 and 28.6 of the major and minor standstills of the moon. This eclipse uh, predicts eclipses. It is also, as you might imagine, oriented to the winter solstice. Many chambers uh, and sites all around the world, I don't know if it's diffusionism or uh, you know, just a reverence for the sun or a, um, a connected culture, but they all do the same thing. That's Newgrange, 3000 BC. Same thing, right down the center. There's a six foot standing stone there also. Why is a farmer gonna do that? November 30th, 1654, John Pynchon, the founder of Springfield, Massachusetts, writes the governor, John Winthrop of Connecticut, and says, we have just discovered a strange stone fort in stone wall um, at Gungiwamp Range, Pequot, in um, Connecticut. Uh, there are many strange reports about it. Do you know anything about its structure? So they showed up in 1654. They asked about these strange structures at the site. Um, I would call that evidence. But anyways, in the, in the chamber, there's a light box that is made. And what it does is it, it emits the equinox sunset light to come through two times a year on the solstice, I mean on the two equinoxes. So the only time it doesn't get close, it shines right through only two days. And that's the back side of it, and here it is right here. And funny, in a Radius of the Lost Ark moment, it's shown into a little antechamber. They unearthed this antechamber, and there's like a quartz keystone right here. So this was unearthed in the 80s when they realized that Peru Mass, a uh, reader from one of my articles, informed me that he knew of a stone chamber in Peru. So I went to check it out, and I was blown away. Ten ten-foot slabs, beautifully made. Look at the joinery. Just, just, you know, quarrying these things alone. Like in all this stuff, all the stone had to be brought to the site, covered in earth. Very, all four corners curve uh, to create a... Uh, a structure that the uh, lintels could sit on. Very beautiful. Just there, there's like an artistic nature to it too, like that stone right there in the corner. Just, I swear that was chosen because it's so beautiful. This is the King's Chamber in New York, one of the largest ones in the country. That is a seven foot standing stone. This is in New Salem, Massachusetts. 10 by five foot capstone, one stone over 10,000 pounds, six feet in the air. That's in Pelham, one of several. 
you have to crawl through. It's a cemetery off a of Gulf Road. Uh, same thing, same construction techniques all around New England. Uh, there are theories, Vikings, Celts, Phoenicians. You would have to be a culture in the Northeast, excuse me, that was widely dispersed, hundreds of thousands of people, to build these structures. If they're, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles apart, um, it just doesn't make a logical sense. You'll see the, the enormity of the structures in New England. That is New Grange, the cobbled roof, 3000 uh, BC in Ireland. These are cobbled roofs in Shutesbury, Pelham, Connecticut. So that doesn't mean the builders were the same. That means the architectural technique is an artifact, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, a, a, a man named Richard uh, from New York State read one of my articles. He's a hunter and he's a stonemason. And he read my uh, Ancient American Magazine article. He contacted my editor, who contacted me, and he said, um, 25 years ago, I found a chamber in the woods. I didn't know what it was. And he said, when he read my article, he realized what it was. And he said, it's plagued my mind, which is a nice way to put it. Richard's a really nice guy. And um, he went back a couple weeks ago and, and took pictures for me. And this is the chamber in New England, I mean in uh, New York, out in the middle of nowhere. No colonial remnants around. Most of these sites, are, they're not connected to a house that, like a root cellar would be. They're just standalone structures. So there's the mound. Amazing. All dry laid. I asked some questions about it. I'm going to see it next week at a conference in New York. And uh, the county historian, Richard, myself, and the president of the New York uh, Antiquities, uh, Northeast Antiquities chapter, we're all going to go and check it out. Uh, I think a false work had to be done to create this. You know, I, I don't see how you can create this chamber without a false work of wood that you burn away after. So, very sophisticated. And Richard said there are some exceedingly large stones interspersed here. Uh, into it. Beautifully done. Yeah. So, the mound builders also built stone chambers. And this is from uh, Jared Folk, uh, work for the Smithsonian. He's talking here about stone chambers which exist in Pike County, Missouri. They have been often mentioned as examples of the skill of the mound builders in this respect. I my thought is that the mound builders, well, I'll say this, the map I showed, they en engulfed all of eastern United States from Wisconsin to Florida for thousands of years. Then they got to the, the foothills of New England and they stopped for some reason, or that's what we're told, that they didn't make it in there. And, and it is accepted that there were trade routes all through New England, that the mound builders were here. Uh, but archaeologists claim that they didn't come any further. That's another theory that I will uh, do my best to debunk. Uh, site of Indian stone heap, known to have existed in 1753, all through the historical text. They call them uh, Indian heaps, Indian mounds. Um, Ezra Stiles, former president of Yale. This is Monument Mountain, Great Barrington, the place Thoreau met Melville. Uh, 18 foot by 6 foot high. This is Ezra Stiles' sketch. I think they took apart uh, this particular uh, carn or stone mound for uh, construction use but that is what he drew. Uh, Frank Lynn, the man who investigated the uh, Andover Chamber, Pilot Point, Connecticut, he investigated these two mounds. He found 19th and 20th century article artifacts on top. Then as he got down, he found um, uh, artifacts, arrowheads, um, fire pits, hearths. And many of these sites have been investigated and found to have been extensively burned and have um, all kinds of artifacts involved, and they're all over the place. I'm a stiff uh, in Buckland. There's a site with hundreds of cairns and beautiful ones at the main site, and I've been back like seven times, and I still can't find it. And uh, I will find it sometime and put it in my PowerPoint, but th th there are sites all around uh, the area we live in, but there's a really nice one on a hill in Buckland. Yes, Susquehanna, uh, Pennsylvania. Beautiful, constructed cairns. And like you see, there's Dozens and dozens, uh, it's, it's beautifully done in a, what appears to be a ceremonial fashion. Uh, that is Minnesota, just to show you the context. These are found everywhere. One thing about stonework that is done in other parts of the, or that is found in other parts of the country, they are much more open-minded about uh, attributing it to um, pre-colonial um, pre uh, cultures. They date it. 
they do what they can to uh, preserve these structures. They're, they're open-minded about it. In New England, not at all. This is a structure that shouldn't exist. It's a postcard I found. Oh, it is in Maine. Um, I don't know if it's a double wall chamber. There are some in um, Irving, Wendell. There's a, there's a double chamber. In New York, there's a double chamber. But this is larger. This is a, look at the scale of this. It's called an Indian mound at the Forks, Maine. This is now destroyed. But this is a structure that should not exist. How was it destroyed? Uh, they took it apart for, uh, uh, I think, for road fill. Yeah, that's great. Um, the Mound Builders. This is from the Smithsonian Report of Ethnology, 1891. Uh, hold carns and chambers, familiar looking objects. And the Mound Builders did this. Uh, the Caldwell Mounds, Nelson Mound, I'm sorry, North Carolina. Uh, they unearthed uh, the mound and they found stone carns uh, and skeletal remains. Look familiar? Ole Hills, Pennsylvania. Nine foot high conical carn. Very impressive structure. Around the country you find uh, effigy walls, serpent walls, turtle mounds made of earth and stone uh, in Wisconsin and elsewhere. In the Northeast you find hundreds and hundreds of turtle effigy mounds that look like turtles. The head. In Connecticut, Vermont, Massachusetts, it, it's uh, indicative of a culture, a ceremonial culture that is uh, building these structures. That's Vermont. Yeah. And this, I have dozens more of these, and obviously, I, time wise, I've got to just give a slice of everything. What I show here is the tip of the iceberg as far as research and pictures are concerned. I'll, I'll show you with that. This is on Bug Hill Road in Asheville. There's an eye, teeth. Balance there. This is balanced. It looks like a fin. I uncovered that so you could see it, and it's notched. Now, that doesn't mean that they put this here. I don't know, but it could be recognized as having anthropomorphic um, characteristics. And then somebody said, let's add to this. Let's make it the turtle, because okay? it is so cool. So there are dolmens and balanced rocks. This caused a stir when the columnist showed up. 90 ton dolmen in North Salem, New York. Antiquarians and open minded people thought they, a culture like the Celts showed up and did this thousands of years ago, what they already seen in uh, Europe. Um, and then geologists and archaeologists rushed in and said, it is a glacial erratic. <laughs> <laughs> there is a chamber in, in fields of Carnes in the neighborhood here, too. So there are other, and it's in the context of other stonework uh, that is enigmatic. Uh, right here, there are five limestone points holding this up. They go six feet down, and they're quarried from over a mile away. Um, di this is in North Salem, New York. It's called Balance Rock. Um, and it's pink granite, or red granite, I think, and that these are limestone points that it's balanced on. And it's a, I have a tough time believing that's a glacial erratic. And you find these all around New England. Uh, this is the wall and hall I was talking about. The last seven stones, the, the wall undulates. Um, this is, a, uh, if you go to the Holly Bog on the left at the Holly State Forest, you take a right, you take that trail, it's like 100 feet, 100 yards down on the left. There's a big glacial erratic here, it's like 20 feet. And the last seven stones, they're joined um, on vertical planes and they're propped up with other stones, the length of it. And it just didn't make sense. I was like, that, the eye, the iris is carved, it's joined here, it looks like a snake head. And very interesting indeed. And then you find other undulating serpent walls that ends, end in heads. Pennsylvania, New York, this is over Overlook Mountain. There's another wall that starts here, goes another 90 feet, and ends in another serpent's head at the site. This is a row and boulder linked wall in Ashfield. What it is, it's a ceremonial wall, uh, or that is my thought in other researches, that is linked together. The erratics along the wall are linked together with stone. So it undulates wildly for a couple hundred yards. It was never on a boundary marker until the 50s, or is never listed as a boundary marker. And it begins and ends without purpose. It doesn't make sense in the colonial context. Why would you connect to all these uh, sites here? <clears throat> Norman Mueller from Princeton did a um, 
uh, a paper and, and researched these walls around the country. And here you see right here. They're connected, they're connected. See right there, the wall in Asheville, like eight feet in the air, there's uh, like a seven foot uh, connecting wall. That just doesn't make sense. So what they're doing is they, they're like an electrical current, whoever built these is connecting all the boulders at the site. When you see this wall, it just doesn't make any sense. There were holes throughout it too, there and there, and that goes up there and on and on. It's just uh, a marvel to look at with huge stones. Right here, many of these stones just linking together. Very interesting. And if you're keeping animals in, why, do you have, why using massive stones in um, keeping holes in, uh, creating holes in the wall? 1851, Squire and Davis, not only um, from the Smithsonian, uh, um, researched all the sites, the earthwork sites. They did some stone wall work as well. This is from New Hampshire, Lock, Lockmere, one of several stone complexes found. When the colonists showed up, they found um, massive trees growing in the ruins of the structure. And, and in the report, uh, Squire talks about them finding carved crystals in the shapes of diamonds, squares, and pyramids. That doesn't sound like colonial work to me. And you, if you see here, these walls at the site are done. See the blocking mounds here, right there? Uh, the earthworks had blocking mounds also. So this could be uh, astronomical orientations like the, the Newark um, earthworks. But these were here when the colonists showed up like many other sites. Um, and all this was taken apart and used for construction uh, of colonial uh, structures. So the mound builders, they built stone chambers, they built stone mounds, and they built stone walls. And uh, it is, I think you'll see that they may have been in New, well, that they were in New England and they may be behind a lot of the stonework we, we've seen tonight. Uh, Native American oral history, uh, they firmly um, speak about the existence of another race in these lands when they showed up. All the tribes do, the northern tribes, the Choctaws, all around the country, every tribe speaks of another race that built the mounds that was here in the country when the tribes moved in. There's no... Um, question about that. And it's just very interesting that they, their oral history is corroborated by a historical record, which we'll see. Uh, the mound builders in New England, artifacts, burial sites, and skeletal remains. So I, I began to study these structures and I couldn't figure out. I said, um, I'm, I know that Native Americans did some stonework, but it, they claim that there was another race uh, around also. So just looking at the evidence, I'm trying to figure out what I believe is a reasoned argument for who was here and who was building these things. So what I found was mound builder artifacts, burial sites, and skeletal remains, the Adena remains in uh, New England. The burial sites and earthworks, I, I must say, there are earthen mounds. Ossipee, New Hampshire, there's a massive earthen mound that was discovered after the revolution. Eight to 10,000 skeletons in concentric rings over generations buried around a common center. Sophisticated culture, thousands of years old. And you find burial mounds and um, mound builder artifacts all around here. In um, Brookfield, an Adena burial site and the mass um, archeological bulletin. In Connecticut, other uh, Adena mound builder burial sites in Windsor, Connecticut. The Adena, they weren't just here trade in uh, you know, trade missions, they were living here. This, I believe, is a mound builder artifact. In 1872, workers were digging post holes uh, near Lake Widow, Pisaukee, New Hampshire. Three feet down, they found this stone. It's made of quartzite. What's interesting about it is there are holes bored in it. They did a bore scope analysis of the stone, and they found that a 1 8 drill bit was used on this side, and a 3 8 drill bit was used here and tapered. The um, professional who did the uh, bore scope analysis said it, it must be modern. He, he said it was put on a metal post and it was bored all the way through. And, but it came, it was found in 1872 under three feet of earth. Um, just, uh, just another enigmatic uh, object that you find around New England. There are many of these that just fit outside uh, the theory that we're told. Uh, in Maine, uh, 
giant skeleton was found, and with it, iron implements, copper bands covered with curious carvings. Uh, um, you find a lot of these reports of hieroglyphs, curious carvings from the Smithsonian to other researchers to town records. There seems there was another culture with a different language. Who you will see, six foot six, was rather large. Iron, iron implements. You, you know, that's the thing, the argument that the Native Americans, if they could uh, work with iron and create uh, alloys with metal, why did they lose that capability? It, and uh, it's a sophisticated thing. And this is in Gill, the town history. Possession of a copper tomahawk unearthed together with the skeleton of a gigantic Indian brought from the region of Lake Superior, history of Western Mass. Um, Lake Superior is where the mines are, where they excavated 1.5 billion pounds of copper, and all that copper was found not only in the earthworks of the mound builders, but also all around New England. In Springfield, uh, you know, the, the trade routes were everywhere. They found uh, shells in Springfield from the Gulf Coast of, uh, of um, Louisiana, and there was this interaction, this, this sphere of trade all around um, the country. This is where it gets a little strange, and I ask you to have an open mind. About a year ago, I, I, I was reading the town histories of um, towns in Massachusetts to figure out if there were reports of um, pre-colonial stonework. If I would find, oh, we showed up and we tilled ye old land and we found a mystery wall or whatever. So I, what I found in, <laughs> was a strange passage from, this is from George Sheldon, eminent historian. Out of the, this was his thousand-page um, town history. He is uh, the founder of the Pioneer Valley Memorial Museum in um, Deerfield, an eminent preservationist also. One of these skeletons was described to me by Henry Mather, who saw it as being of monstrous size, the head as big as a peck basket with double teeth all round. Examined by Dr. Stephen Williams, who said the man must have been the owner must have been nearly eight feet high. So I read that and I, I just uh, kind of made my head spin. And I told my brother, and he said, you got to put that in one of your articles. And I said, well, I said, it's crazy. What does it mean? And, and uh, I did. And I got some feedback where, where some people were questioning, like, oh, this is crazy or this is uh, hoaxes or something like that. So that irritated me and got me motivated to get to the bottom of what was going on. Why, giant skeleton, eight feet high? That's ridiculous, you know? Double row of teeth? We'll get to that part. So what was in the mounds when the Smithsonian and others excavated? The eyes of that extinct species of giant whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as eyes, our eyes do now. Abraham Lincoln, he was parroting what everybody knew at the time, that there was a race that built these structures that was giant in stature. Uh, he went to Niagara Falls in 1848, and he was so um, enthralled with it, he wrote a 500-word meditation, and that's where that passage comes from. I'm sure nobody's ever seen that, and I wonder why. So, the New York Times has hundreds of um, newspaper headlines about what they found at the time. Nine foot, over nine foot high skeleton found nine foot in a Wisconsin mound. This one is 10 foot nine. Uh, this one is very interesting. Uh, Warren K. Moorhead. Um, Moorhead uh, was an, uh, an archeologist, one of the most famous ones at the time. And he unearthed maritime archaic burial sites in Maine. And they say his career was ruined because he theorized that one day they would find bones of the maritime archaic that were very old. Excuse me. And they would find them up in you know, Nelliac Cove in Labrador in, in the northern climates. He was proven right 70 years later. But I have a feeling his career was ruined more because of this and less because of that. Uh, he started to find giant skeletons. Giant skeletons in copper armor, things like that in the mounds, all documented. Uh, and Moorhead was, he found an eight foot, um, I'll get to that story. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But anyways, this is what we found in, in Tioga Point, Pennsylvania. 68 skeletons averaging seven feet with many much larger. Specimens sent to the American Investigating Museum in Philly. Later, the museum claimed they were stolen and have never been seen again. 
Uh, that's a shame. Uh, so you get these reports from Scientific American, American Antiquarian, the Smithsonian Records, New York Times, Town Histories. I have amassed now nearly a thousand accounts of giant skeletons in ancient America. There are other authors who um, write books about these things, and you, you will see that it is, uh, it is a lot more well-known than one would think. So the Native Americans talk, talked about um, massive cemeteries filled with um, giant skeletons. They were dismissed as, as crazy um, you know, myths. Uh, Scientific American, a tradition of giants. That doesn't sound like an isolated ca case, a tradition. Uh, the Smithsonian, this is one of the lot, they have many accounts of seven and eight foot skeletons in their records in the ethnology reports from 1890 to 1894. One of the largest ones, seven and eight feet. Uh, my editor, uh, Wayne May, Ancient American, a lot of articles are um, printed in this magazine about the, what we're talking about. This, this particular one was about three um, over eight foot skeletons found in a Kentucky, it was re the article was reprinted from 1873 in a Kentucky cave. Uh, this is uh, the San Diego giant eight foot four. I know it looks fake, but this is real. Three scientists from the Smithsonian showed up. Uh, these guys were displaying this like a sideshow act at a, a world's fair, I mean some fair in San Diego. They found it eight foot four in a cave. Smithsonian agents, they examined it, they determined it, it was um, authentic. They did tests on it, they bought it for 500 bucks, and we haven't heard from it again. The Smithsonian has 18,000 skeletons of mound builders and Native Americans that nobody can look at. Yes, this it was called the largest skull in the world in Texas, found by WPA workers in the 30s, right there. They are unearthed other large bones there. So, Carolyn Spark, head of the records at Texas Archaeological Research Lab, said, the particular specimen that you ask about, the large skull followed at the Morehouse site in 1939, is noted in our paperwork as missing from the collection and has been for some time. This is the norm. When you investigate these things, when you talk to people, where are the skeletons? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times, there are some around, but a lot of them go missing. 10 foot 9, this is found by the sheriff in Welling, Virginia. Another thing, um, uh, you know, reputable people found these things. Uh, chief justices, judges, uh, doctors. And doctors would always be brought in to, to look at these remains. They would measure them. The, the, the towns, people would be astounded. It would be in the records, you know, as if, and they would say, like, as if never to forget on this day, you know, this 9 foot skeleton was found, and there were people gathered around at the enormous creature from the Stone Age, or however they would speculate about it. So it's not, um, the, the, you know, it, it is a well-known thing. Uh, the Lovelock um, skulls. Bat guano farmers in the 20s found a series of eight, nine-foot mummified giants in Lovelock, Nevada. Uh, the skeletal remains went to, uh, part of them went to um, the Humboldt Museum. Barbara Powell, the curator there, uh, sent back an email saying, yes, in fact, we have some of the Lovelock skulls, the giant skulls. David Hatcher Childress, the researcher, showed these on the History Channel. Uh, that he, it's in a back drawer, but it was on a History Channel special, and he showed the specimens. This is interesting. Uh, this is a site off Santa Rosa Island. Ralph Glidden worked for the Hay Foundation as an archaeologist. He spent 10 years here, and he unearthed 3,781 skeletons the largest was nine foot two. The average was over seven foot for 10 years. And here is the, uh, right there, and this is for, uh, courtesy of Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, over seven feet tall. And this is the double rows of teeth. Uh, when you read these reports, you find double rows of teeth, unusually thick jaw, um, unusually thick skull, jaw bones that can fit over the size of a large man. Just uh, very strange uh, skeletal remains that speak of a different race altogether. So this was found in Clearwater, Minnesota. The highly unusual teeth, skulls had double rows of teeth in both the upper and lower jaws. These reports are widely dispersed. This isn't just one guy who doesn't know what he's talking about. This is everywhere, hundreds of them. So after I went and I found the eight foot uh, double rows of teeth, um, 
report, I went to the uh, Pioneer Valley Museum to see if they knew anything about Sheldon and him finding these remains. So I went to the PV MM and I spoke with them. Uh, I sat down, I went through the records and, and the nice gentleman there said, you may be interested in this. It is the uh, scrapbook, the archeological scrapbook of George Sheldon. And this was my Da Vinci Code moment. I just knew what I was gonna find. <laughs> and I had this, it was amazing. I had this electric shock ran through my body. It, it was quite uh, a happening. So I opened it up and what did I find? Sheldon, his entire scrapbook was filled with accounts of the mound builders of theories about the race that they were, about a lot of conjecture uh, about that they were a different race altogether. I'm sorry, let me interject here. The Smithsonian erroneously concluded in the 1890s, uh, jo John Wesley Powell the, um, of Grand Canyon um, exploration fame, he was the director of the Smithsonian. And for whatever political reason, maybe for a land grab, I don't know what was happening at the time that would account for this. And there's a lot of like Old Testament stuff mixed in in the 1890s. There was undercurrents that, that formed opinions at the time. So Powell concluded uh, that Native Americans, uh, that mound builders were the ancestors of the Native Americans, and that was the end of the story. So that was, the, that was put out, and that's what uh, the, uh, the rule that was to be followed. So everything else seemed to be buried and f funneled into that really narrow um, um, passageway. So what you find here is Sheldon kind of railing against that theory. And then what I found was giant skeleton reports in his book, The Gill Skeleton. They found a giant skeleton in Gill. A Mr. Sanderson gave the remains to the museum. I mean, to the, um, yeah, the museum. Seven and eight foot uh, skeletons in Ohio. There's reports of giant skeletons all throughout um, Sheldon's book, Northfield. The catalog of curiosities and relics, right here. Uh, they had the remains of an, it says an over eight foot skeleton at the museum. They had the Indian room before it was considered, uh, you know, reprehensible to have Native American human remains. Although I think they were mound builder remains, which might be a different thing. But anyways, they had giant skeletons from Northfield, Gill, and an over eight foot one from Ohio that they reinterred sometime in the century. So that existed, it's in the records, they had it on display for many years, uh, starting in 1883, which is very strange. So I started to, I read about 10,000 pages of uh, historical, um, I mean, uh, about town histories in Western Mass, and then I'm a technological neophyte, so I finally figured out I can use Google Books and do keywords, and it got me, uh, <laughs> I know, it's pathetic. Uh, so what I found was, this is from Sheldon's book, uh, seven foot skeleton, double rows of teeth, skull of remarkable thickness in Hadley. Um, this is in Turner's Falls, seven seven foot skeletons, history of Montague, 1910. Seven seven footers. Uh, this is in Rockingham, Vermont. The jawbone was of such size that a large man could easily slip it over his face and the teeth which were all perfect were double. This is interesting. I, this is, I'm looking into this and try to find if the skeleton still remains. The bones of this giant were of remarkable preservation. The skull is very thick. Teeth in both jaws are entire, all of them double. William Prescott of the city has preserved the largest skeleton. Boston Medical and Surgical Journal. That is not UFO magazine. That is, <laughs> you know. When the skeleton was measured, Doc, this is Middleborough where I grew up, Dr. Morrill and others found it to be at least seven foot eight with double rows of teeth in each jaw. Many more giant skeletons are found in Middleborough, actually. Uh, this is in Martha's Vineyard, several giant ones were found. Seven feet high, an unusual feature was a complete double row of teeth, upper and lower jaws. This is what you find, you find the same curiosity, the same phrasings about these, you know, we found, the hell is this? You know, uh, sorry, but you know, double rows of teeth. It just doesn't make any sense, and it it is uh, borne out in all these accounts. Uh, this was um, W.K. Moorhead, William uh, Warren Moorhead. He found eight-foot skeletons um, in Connecticut. The uh, 
the archaeologist I was talking about, whose career was ruined, uh, he also found, this was in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, earthen mounds there. In the Smithsonian 1891 report, it's listed in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut as having extensive um, earthworks in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So the mound builders had extensive earthworks in Bridgeport, and then you find eight-foot skeletons there also. Uh, sorry to throw so much at you. Uh, you know, the questions are, where are they, what's going on? This gives you a kind of a, a feel for what's going on here uh, about the Smithsonian and their involvement in this. A large Indian mound was um, open near Gasterville, Pennsylvania, by a committee of scientists from the Smithsonian. At some depth of the sur uh, from the surface, a kind of vault was found in which was discovered the skeleton of a giant measuring seven foot two inches, ornamented with a copper crown. On the stones which covered the vault were carved inscriptions, hieroglyphs, and when deciphered, will doubtless lift the veil that now shrouds the history of the race of people that once inhabited the par this part of the continent. The relics have been carefully packed and forwarded to the Smithsonian Institution and they are said to be the most interesting collection ever found in the U.S. The explorers are now at work on another mound in Barton uh, County, Pennsylvania. Seven foot three, strange hieroglyphs glyphs that need, need to be deciphered. Copper crown, 130 years pass, and we've never heard this. This, isn't, this is American antiquarian who wrote this report. These are scientists who took part in these digs. The, these just disappeared. Uh, one thing I found interesting when I was <laughs> reading um, the reports, I found that a lot of them were for the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons of giant skeletons. And so I started to read the kind of secret texts of the Freemasons. I hope I make it to next week. Um, <laughs> and I would find the same kind of reports, giant skeletons, uh, double rows of teeth, uh, and part, uh, embedded in the history, they believe, or they, they passed down, I think the Freemasons from the priest, temple priests of Heliopolis in Egypt, I think there was a lineage of, of knowledge that has been passed down about the hidden history of the human race. And part of that is interwoven in this whole story, a lost civilization uh, that's uh, more than 12,000 years old that came to the United States and other places after a great flood. It's just very interesting that you would find this same stuff in the texts of the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons. <coughs> very, very interesting. Um, um, so what you find all around the planet are thousands of structures like this. Uh, Puma Punku, the pyramids, Nan Medal, you know, 500 million tons of uh, quarried basalt brought from several miles across mountains on the, in, in Micronesia, one of the most remote, remotest places on Earth. Uh, Pumapunku, Bolivia, 17,000-year-old city of Tiwanaku in Pumapunku, where you have um, um, stone crosses uh, dug into diorite, the hardest, second hardest substance on Earth. You would need CNC machines to do all the cutting, just things that boggle the mind. And we're told that we came from uh, a semi-civilized state and now at the apex of civilization. Something is clearly wrong. That site proves it. There is much more evidence of older uh, structures all around the planet. You don't find just one. That's all you find, just like the giant skeleton reports. You don't just find one. Something's profoundly wrong in what we're being told. And I think it's obvious by all the interest here and all the people here. You know you've been lied to. You're irritated and you're sick of it, you know? It could be the Fed, it could be the military industrial complex, whatever it is, it's beyond parties. It's about humanity and wanting to create a civilization of love and connection versus fear and separation, quite honestly. And that's why all these systems that don't work appear to be crumbling before our eyes, which is a good thing. So. Um, you know, I, and I also, tonight, I'd like to thank my friends and family. We're all part of this whole research project, although I'm the one talking all the smack. We uh, work together to do all this, and it's really nice to have support, and I'm thrilled that everybody's here. I think it's great. And, uh, you know, this is something we can all take part in. Don't believe what you're told. Get out in the woods. Do whatever you want to, uh, to, to uh, you know, make this reality more known. And I, I'll take questions, but I thoroughly appreciate Everybody coming here.